You are listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. Our topics can include, but are not limited to, murder, sexual assault, graphic and gruesome details, and more. These topics are adult in nature and are not meant for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Kingston Penitentiary was a maximum security prison in Canada that was located in Kingston, Ontario, and is located between King Street West and Lake Ontario. Kingston Pen, as it's referred to, was built between 1833 and 1834 and officially opened on June 1, 1835 as the Provincial Penitentiary of the Province of Upper Canada. At the time that Kingston Pen closed down, it was one of the oldest prisons in continuous use in the entire world. Kingston Pen was eventually replaced by Millhaven Institution. Before it was closed down as a full maximum security prison, in 1971, it would be the site of a riot that lasted for four days, and that riot would result in the deaths of two inmates and the destruction of most of the prison itself. There were hostages taken, there were inmates beaten to death, and nearly to death, and there was a whole heck of a lot to the story. Hello, and welcome to episode 53 of Gone But Never Forgotten, the 1971 Kingston Penitentiary Riot. And welcome back to another episode of GBNF. As Lance said off the top, this episode is going to be looking at the riot that took place in one of Canada's most known maximum security prisons back in 1971. This will be an interesting look inside of Canada's prison system and how riots can go down at times, especially back then. It's certainly something that's eye-opening and something that's very interesting. That is for certain. I have long been intrigued by Kingston Penitentiary and sadly has have not, as of yet, been to the pen yet to see it since its closure and opening as a tourist attraction. That's something that's certainly on my bucket list. Me too, and I think that it's certainly on the bucket list for many, whether they live close to the pen or not. It has been home to some of Canada's most notorious criminals. The Scarborough rapist, Paul Bernardo, the Beast of British Columbia, Clifford Olson, and former Colonel Russell Williams, just to name a few. Yes, Kingston Penn has certainly held a who's who for true crime enthusiasts over the years. We definitely need to make that drive and go check it out before we lose the chance. Who knows when they will shut the place down for good. For now, we'll have to settle for making that trip down the 401 in spirit only. Let's get in our time machines and head back to 1971 in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. I think that it's safe to say that any time that a prison finds itself in the news is generally not a good thing. However, when a maximum security prison finds itself the subject of international news, that almost certainly is bad news. That is what and where Kingston Penn found itself starting on April 14th of 1971 as news broke that roughly 500 convicts had taken the entire penitentiary by storm and amongst other things, they had taken six prison guards hostage. On that morning, the first 12 inmates were moved from Kingston Pen to Millhaven, part of a process that was set to take a long time, but one that had every one of the convicts seemingly up in arms in one way or another. 
The plan was to transfer 40 inmates per month from the pen to Millhaven as the new maximum security prison was still under construction and was not staffed nor prepared for the transfer of a mass amount of inmates. Millhaven was located approximately 18 kilometers to the west of Kingston and was much more modern and believed to be much more secure, which, of course, was of importance for the staff who were charged with watching over some of the worst of the worst in Canada and also important to keep the inmates inside of the prison. The prospect of this move, though, was incredibly stressful for the convicts at the pen because of the fear of the unknown and the rumors that were circulating amongst the prison population of what exactly Millhaven was going to be like. Prisoners heard all kinds of rumors about the Haven. They had heard that there was going to be an electronic bugging system that would ensure that every movement and every conversation was recorded and documented. They were also hearing that there would be cameras inside of every cell that would take away whatever privacy was left for the convicts that were housed inside. Those poor, poor convicts. Like I said, these people were some of the worst of the worst from within our country, and heaven forbid that their lives would get a little bit more difficult after many of them had ruined the lives of many different people to wind up inside of the pen in the first place. They felt that even though Kingston Pen was a hellhole, they knew the intricacies of that particular hellhole, and they would rather stick with the devil that they knew instead of the devil that they didn't. And as such, the hive mentality started to rise up. If you have ever looked in depth at prison riots or watched dramatized versions on television, you have a rough idea of how this started to go. The inmates decided that if they were going to be forced to go out, they were going to go out with a bang. They were not going to leave the pen without a fight. For weeks, the inmates had been whispering, chatting, and spreading the word that they should try to break out en masse, or they should start a riot, or both. Many of the inmates were on board with these plans because, to be honest, most of them had nothing to lose. There were, however, a large number of the inmates who ignored such conversations as well. Inmates inside of the pen that were even remotely close to coming up for parole or the end of their sentence wanted to stay far away from that chatter and even would find themselves hoping that nothing happened. Any type of severe actions that were taken by any of the inmates would likely lead to severe punishment for everyone that was on the inside. Time would not be spent on trying to figure out who all the guilty parties were here, but instead many believed that they would just all be punished. Inmates certainly knew that security would be tightened after the fact and that the guards, who already were unpleasant at best most of the time in their opinion, would seek revenge for any plots or any planned attacks against them or the prison. However, with that being said, with the benefit of hindsight, it appears that those inmates that felt that way looked and listened the other way, but did not sound the alarm to the guards of any potential plans or rebellion. To understand how things happened the way that they did, we should first take a look at the way that things were routinely done inside of the prison. The prison was essentially split into four groups, as far as where they would be and how many inmates would be together at any given time. For example, on April 14th, the first group of 78 inmates was in the rec hall for their time between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m., and the second group would arrive at 8.30 p.m. Then, on April 15th, the other two groups would have their time in the rec hall. The only exceptions to the prison being in quarters was on weekends when half of the prison would be allowed out into the exercise yard at the same time. At 10.30 p.m. on April 14th, the bell would ring, a signal that meant that it was time for the prisoners to move and move quickly and orderly back to their cells. When the bell rang this time, one of the inmates, Billy Knight, motioned for his group of goons to take their places in the line. Charles Saunders and Brian Dodge moved to the front of the line, while Robert Adams, Alan Lafreniere, and Leo Berrio went to the back of the line. The officer who was in charge of moving the group of inmates, Donald Flynn, stood in the corridor between the dome and the gym. 
He took the key and unlocked the gate to the main passageway to the cells and passed the key off to Terry Decker. He walked up the hallway towards the gym and waved to the other guard, William Babcock, in the rec hall. That was the signal for the inmates to start the slow march back to their cells. However, as Terry Decker watched the men pass by him, he failed to notice something that was significant and troubling. Of the group of 20 inmates who were walking to their cells, six of them were not supposed to be there. They were incorrect inmates in an incorrect group walking towards the cells. Decker did realize one thing, however, which in the scheme of things was incredibly insignificant. He noticed that one of the shirt tails on one of the prisoners was exposed. The dress code at the pen was to be obeyed at all times, and because it was not, he barked an order directly at Knight, who was not supposed to be there. He said, quote, tuck that shirt in, unquote. Knight realized that it was now or never. He swung around, and with all the strength that he could muster up, he punched Decker right in the stomach. Decker slumped right to the floor because of the force of the blow, and Knight yelled at him, quote, that's the last fucking order you're going to give, unquote. The riot was officially underway. One of the armed guards who was sitting in the rec area gun cage knew immediately that something had gone amiss when the inmates were ordered back into the rec hall, and he immediately put a call in to the warden, Arthur Jarvis, to report the situation. However, things were moving very quickly at this point, and about the same time that the call was being made, the prisoners rushed into the prison dome area and overpowered six guards and took over that area of the prison as well. From there, all hell broke loose. Between 10.35 p.m. and 1 a.m., the convicts took over the prison bit by bit and did what they wanted to do. The original 60 or so inmates that had started the riot managed to destroy a mechanism that let loose the other 440 prisoners that were inside of the pen. Together, this mob of roughly 500 prisoners destroyed cells, furniture, and equipment in all of the wings of the pen. They broke every single pane of glass that they could find and just absolutely destroyed anything that they could. Around 1 a.m., the prisoners would let three of the guards go that they were holding hostage. It was believed that they did so because of an armed guard that was in one of the cages watching them with the ability to fire shots. One of the things that was certainly a cause for issue for the inmates was exactly that, armed guards. The inmates obviously did not have access to guns. Another issue was that the guards obviously had access to the food, and without food the inmates would have a serious problem. As such, the prisoners organized themselves into groups, with each group seemingly already having been prepared as to what they were to do when the riot reached this point. One group stormed the kitchen to try and get access to the food supply. That group of prisoners, though, was stopped as one of the guards fired a single bullet at the floor to scare them off. Again, seeing as the inmates did not have firepower, this was not something that they could contend with. The inmates would then get in touch with the media, who were obviously well aware of the situation at hand, and tell them that there would be no further shots fired. If there were, they would cut a finger off of a hostage for every round that was fired and toss that finger over the wall. The convicts also issued their first sets of demands through the media. They wanted five to ten prominent citizens from the outside to come into the prison to hear their issues, and they also wanted members of the press to come in and hear a press conference that would be held with prisoners and prison officials. Two members of the Whig Standard, a local newspaper, Sheldon McNeil and photographer Bill Baird, would enter the pen around 10.15 a.m. Thursday, along with other press members to do just that. Just over an hour later, Sheldon would emerge and say that the inmates were in control of about half of the prison, and of that, they held most of the key areas. He would also say that about 500 inmates were involved in the rebellion and that they had taken six hostages to a secluded section of the prison where they were being protected from the more radicalized inmates, but they would be held for negotiating purposes. There were also a approximately 30 inmates that were also segregated because they were deemed to be rats and informants for the guards. 
Other members of the media who met with inmates and guards would say that the prisoners were incredibly well organized and that they meant business in regards to their feelings and their demands. This was not going to be an easy situation to deal with. Because of that, just before midnight on the Thursday, 130 members of the Canadian forces from CFB Kingston entered the pen and they were armed with automatic rifles with bayonets attached. It was relayed that the forces members were there to aid and augment the prison staff and that they were not under any circumstance to confront any of the prisoners. Friday, April 16th would see more members off of the inmates list of citizens that they wanted to come to the prison do just that. Two of those members, criminal lawyer G. Arthur Marin and news columnist Ron Haggart, would go to Ottawa after meeting with the prisoners to let the Solicitor General Jean-Pierre Goyer know what the demands of the convicts were. Friday would also see the inmates release one of the guards that they were holding hostage as a show by them of good faith that they believed that things were moving along in the way that they wanted them to. Around 2 a.m. on April 17th, 100 riot troops from CFB Petawawa would arrive and enter the prison. They brought with them barbed wire, barricades, and riot shields. It appeared as though things were going to come to a head. While this was happening, talks continued between the inmates and the committee that had been formed by the list of allowed citizens that the inmates had provided. Around 1.45 p.m. on April 17th, it was announced that prison officials were going to make an announcement later in the day, but that announcement never came. In fact, what came next was hours of complete blackout. No news came out of the prison, and seemingly nothing and nobody went in. Saturday is when things started to change. Around 2 a.m., a hundred armed troops from the Royal Canadian Regiment entered the prison. People believed that they were simply there for a changing of the guard or shift change, so to speak. There was one problem with that, however. Nobody came out of the prison. That would mean that at that point, there were roughly 230 soldiers in the prison with prison staff and inmates. On Sunday, April 18th, things really started to change. A bus was escorted by a military car and an OPP cruiser through the east gate of Kingston Pen, and it was carrying 50 to 60 prisoners. Throughout the day, that would be the scene. Soldiers kept coming in and prisoners kept coming out. It was believed at the highest point there were 520 armed soldiers inside of the prison on duty. The prisoners that were being removed were being taken to other institutions, some to Collins Bay, some to Millhaven, some to Joyceville, and some to Warkworth. The riot, for all intents and purposes, was over. The hostages were freed, the prisoners were all moved out of Kingston Pen, and police began to enter to start an investigation into everything that had happened. What happened inside was certainly the story here. The inmates, of course, were rebelling against the idea of being moved to Millhaven because they believed that security was going to be tougher and stiffer, but they also took the opportunity to attack, maim, harm, and even kill members of the prison population that were seen by them as the worst of the worst. Oftentimes, people talk about how child rapists and prisoners like that are held in a lesser regard, and that is certainly true. That is something that was seen within the riot. Two men would ultimately be murdered as part of the riot. Brian Ensor was found dead inside of the prison, his body having been stuffed into an air duct that was in the roof, and a second prisoner, Bertrand Robert, would die in Kingston General Hospital a month after the riot from inmate-inflicted injuries. They were two of the 14 men that was, were convicted of sexual crimes against children that were tied in a circle around a radiator in the dome of the pen and beaten and tortured with multiple weapons. Both men would die from various things, but both also had severe head injuries. One of Enser's injuries was a 25 centimeter gash in his leg that the other inmates had poured salt on continuously while he was alive and suffering. This was something that nobody had ever seen before. The prison itself was utterly destroyed. If it could be smashed, it was smashed. And this particular portion of the population inside of the prison was tortured to extreme levels. 
All right, I'm going to say it. I don't feel bad for them. I don't know what kind of person that makes me, but anyone that sexually assaults or commits any kind of crime against a child does not have a right to live, in my opinion. I've said it on the podcast before, I do feel like that kind of person gives up their right to live. I believe in rehabilitation for most people, but killers and anyone that does anything to a child does not deserve that chance, in my mind. The police actually set up shop at Kingston Penn. They reported to work there every day and did not even see the inside of their police stations, really. Getting to the bottom of this was the only thing that mattered. 512 inmates would be interviewed and the investigation would take months. The riot started as we laid out and then the hostages were taken. The inmates would then gather those 14 aforementioned men and start by breaking the nose of each of them. The men were then beaten with pipes, bars, and they had their heads slammed on the floor. The men were then taken back to Section 1D, where they were previously housed, and stacked on top of one another. Many of the other inmates actually believed that all 14 of those inmates were actually dead. In the end, the case would go to trial in late 1971, and 13 inmates were charged with the non-capital murders of Ensor and Robert. All 13 defendants were in the same courtroom with a plethora of lawyers, and in the end, all 13 were either convicted of the charges or pled guilty to the charges. In the end, no concessions were given to any of the inmates as a part of the riots, and the reality was that, if anything, what they had caused was a quicker removal from the world that they didn't want to leave inside of Kingston Penn. Two men lost their lives as a result of the riots, and I will leave it up to you whether that's a tragedy or not. Honestly, I could not find out too much about what their exact crimes were, and to be honest, I didn't want to look too hard. What I will say is that once upon a time, I myself wanted to be an investigator that went after people who committed sexual crimes against children, until I realized that that would mean watching those crimes take place, amongst other things. These people are the worst of the worst, if you ask me. However, even though I find it impossible to have sympathy, it's very obviously the case that these two men did not need to lose their lives in the fashion that they did, either. I don't know that there is a better way to sum things up than that. There are obviously many documented cases of prisoners being killed in prison, Jeffrey Dahmer being an obvious example, but the reality really is that a killer is a killer in my mind. For better or worse, our criminal systems have been made the way they are, and in Canada, we don't have the death penalty. I don't believe that vigilante justice is the answer. Like you said, two people did lose their lives in a way that was not legal, was not justified, and was not necessary. But did they deserve to live, though? That's a touchy question. Feel free to reach out to us and let us know what you think about this case, and maybe specifically about the deaths of these two men. How do you feel about it? We would love to hear from you. And if you want to hear more from us, please come and join us over on Patreon as we share with our patrons what we specifically think about this case. I'm sure that we will have a few things out. Those videos are available to anyone that supports the show by joining a tier on Patreon or anyone that does send us a one-time donation as well. If you haven't signed up with us over on Patreon, this might be the case where you might want to come watch that video because, to be honest, I don't know where Julie stands with this stuff, but I know where I stand and let's just say I'm about to get on my soapbox. So that's where we're going to leave this episode for this week. Thank you all for listening. And we will see you next week right here on Gone But Never Forgotten.